Welcome back to our study of eschatology. This is eschatology session number 14, our final session, and today we will be talking about post-millennialism. We've been talking here at the end of our study about the various views of the millennium. We've talked about historic premillennialism. We've talked about dispensational or pre-tribulational premillennialism. We talked about amillennialism, and we'll conclude by talking today about post-millennialism. Now, the pre and post there on those different names has to do with whether Jesus is going to come before or after this thousand years, this millennium. And in the case of amillennialism, it's not a matter of before or after as much because the millennium is taking place right now. But in post-millennialism, the main idea is that Jesus is going to return after the millennium. And we'll talk about some of the major points of this view. We'll talk about some of the uh, apparent weaknesses of this view. And we'll also look at uh, where from Scripture a view like this might come from, and some things in Scripture that would seem to argue against this particular view. But first, let's begin uh, once again, by reading Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, this is the key passage for uh, talking about the millennium. It's the only place in the Bible where this thousand-year reign is explicitly mentioned. And here's what it says, Revelation 20, 1 through 6. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years." Now, as we talk about this final view of the millennium, talking about post-millennialism, let me say something I say often whenever I'm teaching eschatology. You've probably heard me say it in this series, and that's this. No matter what view you hold on these things, there is someone smarter and godlier than you who holds a different view. Right? So we can't let this, regardless of what your view is, we can't let this become a matter of division or a matter of judgment within the body of Christ. We, we can't say, if you really studied your Bible, if you really love the Lord, this is the position that you would hold. Because there are, again, godly people, wise people, diligent students of the Bible who hold a different view than you, who hold a different view than me, no matter what view you or I may hold, there are godly, diligent Bible students who hold or have held to all of these different views. So it's not a matter of loving the Lord. It's not a matter of just you know studying your Bible. Um, these are difficult questions that Christians disagree on. And that's not to say that we shouldn't um, have convictions or opinions uh, about what the Scripture teaches, but we need to make sure that we don't uh, say that those who hold a different view from us are not taking the Bible seriously or, or not taking the Lord seriously. Now, I say that again this time because the post-millennial view is probably the one that will seem the most strange to most of you and will seem the most unlikely to most of you. Um, a couple of people who uh, I believe held this view who were godly, diligent students of the scriptures. Uh, one of them was Jonathan Edwards, who's the most famous uh, American theologian from the colonial days. You might have read 
uh, his sermon or part of his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, when you were uh, in school. Um, and he was a part of the First Great Awakening, uh, one of the, the preachers and chroniclers of that awakening. Uh, there's much more to him, by the way, than the impression that you get from that sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Um, and he, he, if I'm not mistaken, was a post-millennialist. So also, uh, I think, was a man named William Carey. William Carey is uh, the father of Baptist missions. Um, he was an Englishman who um, worked diligently and uh, became a missionary. Uh, he went over to India. He translated the Bible into numerous different languages. Um, he was exceptionally gifted uh, with languages and, and um, was a amazing translator of the Bible as far as his output goes. Um, and he was also a preacher and, and so on. And again, both of these men, if I'm not mistaken, they uh, held to post-millennialism. There, um, I think I know of at least one, maybe two or three people um, who are post-millennialists even now, though it's not nearly as popular of a view as it used to be. My understanding from what I've heard about, you know, the history of these things is that this view was far more popular before the 20th century and the first and second world war. This is a view that teaches that um, things are going to get better until Christ comes back. The millennium is sort of a golden age of the church. Things are going to get increasingly better throughout church history, um, or at least at the end. And then that's going to sort of climax in this millennium, this golden age of uh, Christianization of the world, basically. And then at the end of that, Jesus will come back. Now, <clears throat> think about this with me for just a moment. To you, that is very possible that that sounds crazy and totally out of sync with the Bible. But think about this for just a minute. What if you had lived in, let's say, the 1600s, the 1700s, the 1800s, somewhere around there, and leading up to your day had been the Protestant Reformation, the recovery of the gospel, this great uh, revival, in other words, of, of gospel preaching and gospel teaching. And then from that came a period of uh, growth in uh, theology. Um, there were the Puritans, there were, you know, there was, and then there was, then there came the, the beginnings of the modern missionary movement. There was the Great Awakening in uh, North America and England, and there was this missionary movement with men like William Carey and Adoniram Judson and others who were taking the gospel uh, all around the world to places where, um, as far as people knew, the gospel hadn't been taken in, in quite a long time. And so there was this, um, there were conversions, there was a spreading of the gospel, everything seems to be on the up and up. Everything seemed to be getting better as far as the growth of the church was concerned. And then <clears throat> came the 20th century, right, with World War I and then World War II, and then people said, well, wait a minute, maybe things aren't getting better and better and better. Things appear actually to be getting worse. And so uh, the Post-millennial view has become um, much less popular and to many people much less plausible in part because of what has gone on in the period of history uh, just before ours and that some of us have lived through. Uh, whereas if you had lived two or three hundred years ago, you might have thought, wow, things are really, really getting better. So um, here's how one theologian <clears throat> uh summarizes, I feel like this is very straightforward and very clear, uh, summarize, uh, summarization of the post-millennial view. This is from that book I mentioned before, The Meaning of the Millennium. And uh, this is what this theologian says. He says, post-millennialism is the view that the kingdom of God is now being extended in the world through the preaching of the gospel and the saving work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of individuals that the world eventually is to be Christianized, and that the return of Christ is to occur at the closing of a long period of righteousness and peace, commonly called the millennium. It should be added that on post-millennial principles, the second coming of Christ 
will be followed immediately by the general resurrection, the general judgment, or the final judgment, and the introduction of heaven and hell in their fullness. So there are four things um, that we can say, and I think most, if not all of them, were there in that definition. Four things that we can say are sort of the central elements of the post-millennial view. One is that Jesus will return after the millennium, hence post-millennialism. Number two is that the millennium will be a golden age of the church on earth. As um, that theologian said, uh, the world will be Christianized, right? Think about uh, the Middle Ages when in Europe most people were Christians, most people went to church at least occasionally, um, most people at least, you know, outwardly uh, were, were Christians. Um, that's sort of a Christianization of, um, of Europe, right? And they're saying the millennium is going to be sort of a Christianization of the whole world. Uh, that's number two. Number three, things will not grow worse until Christ comes, but will actually become better. We'll come back to that in just a moment. That's the one uh, that perhaps seems most unlikely, especially if you've um, mostly been taught premillennialism. That's the exact opposite, right, of what you've been taught, the Bible says. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then number four, the millennium will be followed by the return of Christ, the resurrection of believers and unbelievers, the final judgment, and the final state. So that's the, the heart, the essence of postmillennialism. Now let's go back to that piece that says, things will not grow worse until Christ comes, but will actually become better. As we said before, there was a period of history where it looked like things were getting better and better, right? Where the gospel was spreading, more people were being saved, the gospel was being taken to more places, and it looked like this, um, that, that the gospel would spread to all the earth and that there might be this great uh, revival and awakening that would, with you know, untold numbers of people being saved and so on and so forth. And then the, the, 20th century, with all of its death and destruction and war, sort of wiped that vision off the map for most people. But, uh, but a post-millennialist even today, I think, would, would push back on, uh, on those of us who hold a, a more premillennial view, who think that things are going to get worse and worse and worse, and, and who think that things are getting worse and worse and worse. And by the way, right now, it's very easy to say that, right? To look around in the world and say, things are clearly getting worse, right? But here's what I think a, a post-millennialist would, would say. Are things really getting worse or do they just appear in the things that we see in the news and the media and whatnot to be getting worse? Aren't things better in terms of medicine? and um, average lifespan and, you know, uh, technological developments, aren't all those things getting better? Uh, what about the spread of the gospel? We might see um, some decline in the number of people who seem interested in the gospel and who are interested in, in church and go to church and whatnot, but what about the rest of the world? Aren't there millions of Christians in China now? Aren't there people coming to faith in the Middle East, isn't the gospel um, flowering and flourishing in South America and in Africa? Maybe our pessimistic pessimistic perspective, which is what maybe a post millennialist would call it, you know, sort of think things are getting bad, things are getting worse. Maybe that's mainly due to the part of the world we're looking at. Europe and North America, maybe things aren't so great in terms of the flourishing of the gospel. But what about the whole rest of the world? Isn't the gospel spreading and flourishing there? So a post-millennialist will push back both in terms of the spread of the gospel and in terms of um, you know, quality of life and, and, and whatnot um, and say, Actually, I think things are getting better and are continuing to get better. Of course, there are some bad things. Of course, there are some dark spots. Of course, there are some serious hardships. And, and no one would want to, um, you know, discount the severity of, you know, the two world wars and all the other bloodshed in the 20th century um, and what has crept even into the 21st. But nonetheless, there are some signs, I think they would say, that things are, on the whole, continuing to get better. And so that's what the post-millennial view teaches. Is there any hint of that 
in Scripture. Let me show you one passage. It's a, a pair of parables in Matthew 13. Let me draw your attention to these and see if you can just see how. You don't have to agree, but see if you can see how a post-millennialist would hear in these verses a, an affirmation of what they are saying about the way things are going to play out. Right. So this is Matthew 13, uh, starting in verse 31. It says, He put another parable before them, saying, so this is Jesus talking, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. And so you've got this mustard seed. This is what the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is like. When the kingdom of God comes, it looks small and insignificant. You've got one teacher who's not an officially authorized, you know, rabbi authorized by the authorities. And he's got a sort of ragtag band of followers, right? Some of them maybe from more, uh, you know, from all kinds of different walks of life, <clears throat> but not the kind of group of people you would expect to change the world with, <clears throat> right? So it's this small mustard seed, but then what happens? It grows into a tree. It becomes the largest plant in the garden, and the birds of the air... <clears throat> come and make nests in its branches. So I think a post-millennialist would read that parable and say, look, the gospel starts out small. It starts out seemingly insignificant. The kingdom of God starts out as this little tiny thing that looks like it's not going to make much difference. But in the end, it grows into this huge tree that provides a, a place for all the birds of the air to come, um, or not all the birds of the air, but for the birds of the air to come and, you know, and make nests. It's this huge thing. Right? And then the very next parable sort of builds on that. Verse 33 says, he told them another parable. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Right? So if the kingdom of heaven is the leaven, and you put the leaven in the dough, and then you work the dough until the leaven spreads through the whole lump <clears throat> until all of it is leavened, doesn't that sound like? The kingdom of God, the gospel, is going to spread and influence the whole world? You could see how a post-millennialist post would say, <clears throat> those parables are what I'm talking about. Those parables teach what I'm trying to say from a post-millennial perspective. Again, you don't have to agree with that interpretation, but can you at least see it? Can you at least see where they're coming from? <clears throat> All right, now, what are the arguments against post-millennialism. Well, of course, <clears throat> one of them is that a lot of people would say things don't seem to be getting better, and the Bible itself seems to indicate that things are going to get worse. For example, in 2 Timothy 3.13, <clears throat> it says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Jesus himself in Matthew 24, 9-14 says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. <clears throat> and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So both of those verses sound mostly like Things are going to get worse. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be hardship, right? Um, <clears throat> number two, pushback. Revelation 19 seems to indicate that Jesus is going to return before the millennium of Revelation chapter 20. If What is Revelation 19 about, <clears throat> right? If it's not about the return of Christ preceding the millennium. Number three, the Bible indicates that those who will be saved will be few, and many will remain lost. If the whole world is Christianized, is that still true? How do we square that with the idea that most people will be saved? And number four, the Bible seems to indicate that suffering will be a reality for Christians until Christ returns. 
what would we do with the Bible's teaching about suffering and persecution and so on if almost everyone in the world was a Christian or at least professed to be a Christian or at least tried to act like they were a Christian? What, what would we do with that? Right? Um, now, a, a post-millennialist might come back and say, don't you believe in the power of the gospel? Don't you believe that the gospel is powerful enough to save people all over the world? Don't you believe that the kingdom of God is powerful enough? Don't you believe that God is powerful enough to transform the whole world? These are difficult questions, right? There are <clears throat> places in the Bible where all of us can go where we think our view is supported. And um, that's what we need to keep doing is keep going back to the Bible, right? Not just to try to support our view, but to try to understand all the parts of the Bible and try to see how all of the texts, whether we're in Ezekiel or <clears throat> Matthew 13 or Revelation 20 or whatever, how all of them fit together and hold whatever view we hold with humility, knowing that there's probably something that we've missed, that we don't have it all figured out. But as we started with <clears throat> earlier in this series, the things that we want to emphasize are the things that are clearest in the Bible and the things that all Christians agree on. We want to affirm that Jesus is coming back. We want to affirm that uh, whether or not we believe in Christ in this life matters for eternity. There is uh, going to be a final judgment. There is such a thing as hell. There is going to be a new creation, a new heavens, and a new earth. And that's where we want to be. And that's where we want everyone to be. We want people to be saved. <clears throat> um, so we want to focus on those things that we know uh, all of us ag agree on. And as um, <clears throat> going back to where we started at the very, very beginning... I hope that this study has not only helped you to learn, has not only encouraged you to dig into the Bible some more, but I also hope that this study has motivated you to pursue holiness now, to pursue Christ-likeness now, and has increased your anticipation of the return of Christ, that you are able to say now more than ever, come Lord Jesus, right? So, um, last thing is <clears throat> that this is the end of our study, as I said, of eschatology at the, at the beginning. And um, what we're going to do next, Lord willing, is we will begin next week with a study of the Beatitudes from the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, those famous statements of Jesus, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and so on. We'll begin a study of those next time. I look forward to um, thinking through those, meditating on those, applying those, learning from those together with you, Lord willing, beginning next week. And one more time, let's say, amen and come Lord Jesus.